So this will be the 17th Pythagorean Order of Death podcast. Welcome to it. I'm your host, as always, Jonathan Barlow G. Um, this is going to be another on the Pythagorean Order of Death material itself. As you can probably see from the background, just as in the last video that I literally just finished making, which was the 16th podcast and the third on the POD material. So this will be the fourth installment on the Pythagorean Order of Death material. And again, the 17th episode of the podcast. Uh, these questions are submitted by Andrews Lux again. Uh, all always a friend of the uh, the podcast and a uh, friend of my publications as well. Uh, and he's submitted 15 questions. So this should be a relatively longer uh, episode than the last uh, episode that I just recorded, uh, which was only six questions um, long by uh, our mutual friend Ganma. So, uh, without any more uh, doodling around by me, I'll just step right into the question and answer section and proceed. Is the POD designed for the future? The POD omnibus contains all the designs needed to create Atlantean society. So, in a sense, the POD omnibus itself is presented as a bridge between our modern social reality and Atlantean society. In my own works, Atlantean society is imagined as being the better of two possible futures. So the POD material is presented as a utopia, contrary to the dystopia described in my Cheshire Sam novels. In Atlantean society, as I've imagined it, humanity has evolved to transcend our own biological forms and exists as a species of energy beings that are able to manifest themselves in any form they like. In the Lemurian Church Bank Charter, it outlines one possible path to get from where we are in the here and now to this next phase of our existence, stating that a global wireless electricity network of Tesla towers, powered by a single zero-point energy engine, could bring this about gradually. It remains unlikely, in my personal opinion, that Atlantean democracy can succeed as a form of global government unless such a system for the transmission of power is put into place to support it. So, in short, yes, the POD material is very much a design meant and intended for the future. How is zero-point energy, ZPE, used as currency? ZPE is used instead of or in place of currency, and not as a currency itself. The general idea, as laid out in the Lemurian Church Bank Charter in the POD Omnibus, of creating a global network of Tesla towers is to provide a decentralized power grid for the transmission of electricity wirelessly. In the short term, such a system can be used to provide global electrical utility coverage, making cell phone and electric car batteries obsolete, and in the longer term could possibly allow the development of new technologies, such as energy-to-matter replicators, that could translate the excess wireless electricity into any material substance, including advanced forms of 3D printed food. Such a wireless utility grid could remain active in perpetuity if provided a source of power to run it that is without limit itself. 
Thus, one of the main goals of establishing such a global network of Tesla towers is the development of new technologies capable of harnessing zero-point energy. So using ZPE to manifest matter will, it is predicted, come to replace money. Can you explain the use of the term Neosethians and what they represent in your literature? In my own works, I use the term Neosethian to refer to all modern Second Coming Christians, specifically, and to all modern eschatologists in all religions generally. My reasoning for this my reasoning for use of this term is that 2,000 years ago, there was a cult called the Sethites who believed in the imminent return and second coming of Seth, the first human-born son of Adam and Eve. Just so now, 2,000 years later, people believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ and in the apocalyptic end of days. This belief in the second coming and the end times has spread out and is no longer adhered to exclusively by Christians, but practiced by Orthodox Hebrews and theocratic Muslims also, who are, even as I write this, engaged in a conflict in the Holy Lands in an attempt to bring this event about. Indeed, with the proliferation of nuclear ICBMs and other such weapons of mass destruction, we do seem to be drawing closer to bringing about the extinction of all life on Earth with every passing second. So it is this general belief in the second coming of Christ specifically, and in the end times generally, that I mean by my use of the term Neosethian. What is the mission of the five masters? The smallest iteration, according to the POD's ideal number theory, at which democracy can begin, is in a group of five people. One person is alone. Two people are in love. Three people are a conspiracy. Four people are a republic. And five, a democracy. Just as it should be self-evident that one is alone and cannot individually be any of the things the individual can be, if in the larger number some groups, so too should it be clear that two people constitute a conspiracy called love, in which both parties are exactly equal. And just as the minimum possible number of people necessary to comprise a destructive conspiracy is three, a misdirector, a confederate, and a dupe. So is a group of four considered the basic republic because it is the smallest even number sum group above the pair. The POD explains that the smallest possible number sum group to represent democracy is a group of five people because this is the smallest odd number sum greater than three. Just as a republic is seen as being a state or government structure based on the family unit, a democracy is seen as being a conspiracy or clutch that is constructive rather than destructive. The mission of the five masters in a POD clutch, in this sense, is simply to spread the information about Atlantean democracy founded on such ideal number theories and found in the POD omnibus. Jakeen and Boaz, what are they in your interpretations? Originally being the names for the bronze pillars on the porch of the Temple of Solomon, Jakeen meaning he establishes and Boaz meaning in strength. Through progressive Freemasonry and Christian Kabbalah, the roles of these twin pillars have been expanded by being applied to the Naples arrangement of the Tree of Life. In this context, Jakeen is the white pillar on the right, 
and Boaz is the black pillar on the left, and they symbolize a dichotomy similar in the West to the concept of the yin-yang symbol in the East. Can you explain Adam, Eve, Cain, Seth, and Abel in your models? This collection of names refers to the first family of the book of Genesis, the first people to have been created by God, according to the myth of the Abrahamic religions. In my own research, and thus in the P.O.D.'s historical records, these were each meant to symbolize one of the pre-human species alive in the epochs leading up to the earliest appearance of the Homo sapiens species. So, Adam represented the Australopithecus species, Eve the Proto-Hominid species, Cain the Cro-Magnon species, Abel the Neanderthal species, and Seth the original human. It is explained in Genesis that Cain killed Abel and that Cain's lineage died off in the Great Flood, leaving only the bloodline of Seth as the origin of the human genome. The relation between these three brothers, Cain, Abel, and Seth, as the sons of Adam and Eve, can be seen as a relation between good and evil, in which evil, Cain, triumphs over good, Abel, temporarily, but ultimately the middle way, Seth, survives the longest. Thus, this group of concepts can also be applied to the better and worse future timelines that revolve around the middle or mainstream timeline. I predict that, instead of the triumph of Seth as the middle way, we will see the mainstream timeline coming to an end with the impact of the asteroid Apophis in 2029, followed by a massive divide between the better and worse futures. In short, in 2029, the Seth timeline will end, and after then, only the Cain and Abel timelines will continue. What is a mental university in Psychic Atlantis? In the maps and designs I have made for Agati, the capital city of Atlantis in the POD literature, one of the ten rings of islands is a level of schools and universities. For the deeper researcher of the POD material, it should be noted these schools and universities in Agati, capital city of Atlantis, are not the same as the four elemental lodges that perform the initiation ceremonies which pass petitioners to possess certain ranks and roles in Atlantean society. The schools and universities in Agate Atlantis teach all subjects known to mankind with a class size of no more than three students per each teacher. These are not real people, places, or things yet, so one, can as, so one can, as of now, still only dream of and imagine these in one's own mind and hope to prosper from such. However, as the P.O.D.'s saying goes, until dawn over Atlantis, it is still dark of night. What are the duties and privileges of the Pope? In Atlantean democracy, it is possible for one of the seven chief executives or world presidents to be elected Pope of the Lemurian Church Bank. The single duty and privilege due to this Lemurian Pope while they are serving as one of these seven chief executives is that they may pass or veto a motion if it reaches a tie vote among all the other chief executives besides themselves. In regards to the Lemurian Church bank system, the Pope holds the keys to access the main node of the entire system, the single data port that stores the whole system's memory records. If this node were damaged, lost, or destroyed, 
the Lemurian church bank would have to start over. How does society work with no law? Society does not work with no law. Society is the body of the law, and the law is, at the very least, the backbone of society. That is to say, without one, the other dies. So, if you take away law, you lose society, and if you remove society, you will have no more law. The question, however, should not be, how can humanity survive without society? But, has society done humanity any good? Society and the law are tools of our domestication, and for 6,000 years at least, they have been used to stunt humanity's natural evolutionary progress and induce a condition of what is called nowadays neoteny onto our species, wherein we are unable to mature physically and psychologically at our own natural rate. So, if society and law have been harmful to human evolution and have done more to hinder than accelerate beneficial technologies, then do we truly need or even want them? Are they not like the yoke of an oxen that is tethered to nothing and simply sits on the poor beast's back, wearing it down? Without society and law, culture, and genetic biodiversity, remain and prosper. Can you explain why anarchy is the ideal form of government? Anarchy is not the ideal form of government. Anarchy is, by definition, the absence of government, just as atheism is the absence of religion. To say anarchy is the ideal form of government conflates the distinctly different quantum states of the particle and the wave. Government, in this sense, would be the particulate format for the measuring the quantum information unit, the wave state of which would be anarchy. Anarchy, being humanity's natural condition, is older than and will likely outlive humanity's attempt to tame itself using government, society, and laws. In this sense, just as existence precedes essence, so does anarchy precede government. So, to this extent, government may be thought of as the essence of the same natural state as anarchy is the real, material, substantial existence. In other words, anarchy is ever-present, just below the thin veneer of law-abiding civility. It is, indeed, a necessary instinct for identifying what constitutes an unjust law that deserves to be disobeyed. Without love of natural anarchy, there would be no countermeasure force to oppose imposed tyranny. What is Kether Consciousness? According to the interpretation of the Tibetan Buddhist Bardo Total by 1960s psychedelic guru Tim Leary, when it is mapped onto the usual 10 Sephirot model of a Kabbalistic Tree of Life diagram, Kether consciousness would correspond to the attainment of oneness with the primary clear light of the Chikai Bardo in the meditative trance state called Samadhi the Buddhist equivalent to the Hindu nirvana. In the Western tradition of Christian Kabbalah, Kether consciousness corresponds also to the concept of the crown of thorns associated with Christ consciousness or oneness with the spiritual being of Jesus as son of mankind. <clears throat> Who was the Babylonian Marduk? According to Wikipedia, Marduk was a god from ancient Mesopotamia and patron deity of the city of Babylon, who eventually rose to power in the first millennium BC. 
In the city of Babylon, Marduk was worshipped in the temple Isagali. Isagila. Is Isagila. Marduk is later considered the son of Enki, Ea. End quote. In the Enuma Elish, Marduk has bestowed the appellation Son of the Sun. In Egypt, Marduk was equivalent to Horus Ra, in Greece to Zeus, and in Rome to Jupiter. Just as Greek Zeus was the son of Cronus, Roman Jupiter was the son of Saturn, Egyptian Horus Ra, the son of Osiris, and Babylonian Marduk, the son of Enki. And just as Zeus rose up against Cronus in the Titan Amaki, so too did Jupiter succeed Saturn. Horus Ra revenged his father's murder by Set, and Marduk was the son and heir of Enki, who was the watcher over the Abzu, or underground waters, and thus keeper of the keys to Kerr the Sumerian underworld. So, in the first millennium BC, this deity was revered as a warrior god, in contrast to his counterpart deity, Demuzi, or Tammuz. Demuzi, the gentle shepherd deity, would inspire the ethical teachings of Jesus Christ, while Marduk was the violent, zealous twin that likely went on to inspire the character of Satan as he was described in the witch's hammer of the Catholic Inquisition. In short, Marduk was an earlier, vengeful, and wrathful deity who bore many of the same attestations as, later, would Jesus Christ, as yet another son of God. Though Jesus appears to have believed, oppositely Marduk, in peace unto death, Can you explain Alpha and Omega members in POD group dynamics? Among the clutch of five fellow travelers, the first goal is for each to initiate two new members to act as a pair of alternates and guards beneath them. Once this is done, a lodge of 15 members may be formed. Once there are, at least, four such lodges, then the five lodge members can also join the Atlantean Senate, formed of at least 20 members, the five masters from each lodge. Now, the importance of ranks in lodge is, rever is reversed in Senate, such that the Grand Master in lodge, who is the highest rank there, is also the Essene Zealot in Senate, the furthest from the area chair. Likewise, the area chair holds the highest rank in Senate, but the lowest rank in Lodge, their alternates guarding the porch outside as the Bohemian camp. So one who seeks any role in this hierarchy will eventually end up playing both the role of the Alpha, or leader, and the Omega, or follower. The goal of this method is to teach responsibility and humility. What is the Neshama exactly? In Hebrew metaphysics, Ruach, meaning literally breath, is traditionally the title for the soul, and Neshama, meaning wind or ostensibly the breath of God, is the spirit. This can also imply one spirit over many souls, such that the spirit is like a template or frame, and the soul is like its imprint onto media. This idea is used in the myth of the Hebrews being the chosen people of the Abrahamic God, where it is said that the many Hasidim are each a soul or spark seeking to return to the one spirit that is their God. The idea persists in German myths also, where the word geist means spirit. So, in this context, there may be such a thing as a spirit of a town, or even a zeitgeist, the spirit of an era or time.
Can you explain the blue bloods in your works? Blue blood is a derogatory term for a hemophiliac whose blood does not contain enough red blood cells to act as clotting agents to scab over a wound. It was applied by the Bolsheviki against the Russian czars, who were related directly to the German emperors and to the British royalty, forming the monarchical ruling class over all three nations. The reason this ruling class were anemic is due to generations of inbreeding between the ruling families of the various territories, resulting in many genetic defects, one of them being to exhibit anemia or blue blood. Given the science available in the early 20th century, those who opposed this ruling class speculated these inbred monarchs were all RH negative, meaning that their genetic code lacked the profile of the rhesus monkey gene common to the rest of humanity. Later 20th century researchers, such as David Icke and Jim Mars, among others, speculated that these ruling elites had inbred to consolidate power among a shrinking group of families because they were all directly descended from the rulers of ancient Mesopotamia, who comprised an ancient Babylonian Brotherhood. Most of these claims do not prove to be true, but it is only in the context of conspiracy theory I use this term in my own works. Can you explain macro and micro gravity? Macro gravity relates to the premise of gravity being caused by distortion to the surface of space time as in Einstein's general theory of relativity. On the other hand, microgravity refers to the premise of quantum gravity, or the effect that attracts electrons into orbit around atomic nuclei. While modern quantum astrophysics cannot figure out how these two very different size scale forces are reconcilable, if one considers gravity as being an effect transmitted by tachyon quanta in a zero-point energy field, faster than light and smaller than a micron, then the effect of gravity is a matter of a cumulative field of such tachyon quanta in both cases. Of course, one may not end up needing such a luminiferous ether field to account for the force of gravity, but if one factors one into explaining the force of gravity, it will certainly make more sense. Consider that the strong, the strong nuclear force of fusion, the weak nuclear force of fission, and the electromagnetic force all have, to some extent, a repulsive or repellent effect that the force of gravity alone seems to not only lack, but to oppose. Gravity is an ever-attractive force, but it may still be possible to reconcile it with this repulsive trait of the other forces if one considers apparent attraction actually is repulsion, just seen backwards chronologically. If we measure the fastest rate of time as light speed, but say the tachyon quanta exceed this velocity, it raises the possibility that the force these tachyons carry can move faster than time, and so possibly even backwards in time. This, in turn, poses the possibility that tachyon quanta may be a repulsive, force-carrying field, simply operating in reverse to our own local continuum's chronology and thus having an attractive effect on all larger scales of matter energy. In short, I propose that tachyons are the quanta of gravity. And that's that for the uh, 17th episode of the POD Pythagorean Order of Death podcast. Uh, those questions, those 15 questions were posed by Andrus Lux. Uh, they were about the Pythagorean order of death material, more or less, uh, which means this was the fourth installment 
of a podcast, uh, POD podcast about that. Again, uh, I'm about to chop all these answers up into clips. And I hope that you'll tune in to this podcast as well as the last podcast that I recorded just before this. Also on the POD material with the questions by Genma. Uh, if you are tuning in, I thank you very much for doing so. And if you aren't, I understand your reasons, uh, probably because of me being uh, too shadow banned for you to be aware I exist. So if you have found me, you're one of a blessed, sacred, special few. And if you have not yet found me, it's probably because I'm being oppressed. I'm being oppressed. So while you get advertisements, uh, while you get advertised, I get penalized. So thanks to everybody else on YouTube and all my fans and, and friends here on this platform. You know I love you. Okay. I'll shut up before I say something that you would really regret. Have a good one. Hope everybody is doing great. And uh, as always, peace.